Darlene, uh, you became a member of your learning body about mm, not even six months ago, I think. I think it was like November. Mm -hmm. And can you just tell us what your life was like before you joined your learning body? Um, it was a life of chronic pain. Uh, I had a partial dist discectomy many, many years ago. Uh, spinal fusion about probably about 15 years ago of L4 and L5. Uh, I now have scoliosis as a result of that fusion. And I have the usual getting old things, some uh, um, arthritis, uh, have two bad knees with degenerative tears, aka old person knees. Um, I had gotten injections of Uflexa in both knees for about five years. They stopped working right around the time that my radio frequency ablations were no longer working. And that brought me to the possibility of a spinal cord stimulator, which depressed me, scared me. Uh, I decided that I was not going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I mentioned in one of my uh, communications with you yesterday about, I think it was about 25 years ago, I became interested in Feldenkrais. I can't remember why, whatever brought me to it, but uh, I asked all the professionals I knew in the greater Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area if they knew any local pr practitioners, and nobody did. So I looked for the one closest to Pittsburgh, and that's how I found you. So it was probably about 20 years ago that I called you and we talked briefly and you offered me online classes. And I just didn't think that would work for me. It's interesting to think about if I'd made a different choice at that time. Uh, and so I just kind of let things go for a while. But every once in a while, I'd see something or hear something from you or about you. Um, so right before I uh, joined your living body, I had signed up for Ease Your Knees. Pronounce her first name for me. Ephery Arafilly just the way it looks. And after two classes, my knees didn't hurt anymore. Two classes. You know, when I talk about this sometimes, it's, it's still hard for me to believe that I'm 95% free, pain-free most of the time. Um, I can work in the garden for you know, 45 minutes at a time. Uh, if I overdo it, especially with bending forward, then I'll feel it. But I do my classes and, you know, here I am. Um, wow. so, that's, so would you yeah. say that, mo what, what would you say was your rock bottom moment for you? Was it the moment that they taught, told you about the spinal stimulator? Yes, I'll never forget him telling me I can't offer you anything else because this, the pain doctor that I was seeing is really amazing. He teaches all over the world. He offers a variety of uh, procedures. And like I said, I, I've i lost track of how many radio free, radio frequency ablations that I've had, but they just they pretty much stop working after a couple months and, you know, they're invasive and they are. that they're kind of scary themselves. And I just, uh, I really went into a dark, dark place, darker than I've ever been. Even with all those decades of chronic pain, I can almost feel the tears as I talk about remembering what that was like. And, uh, 
somewhere, I can't remember where, I found that class and I thought, well, I'll start with my knees. <laughs> Two classes and then your living body was made available and I said, I'm doing it. I'll probably be one of yours till the day I die. Uh, one of the members. So uh, you, and, your your number one goal was probably to get rid of pain. Yes. Yeah. To get my, well, to get my life back, to look at the bigger option, you know, your life becomes, um, it's like wearing somebody else's per prescription eyeglasses. Everything is distorted because they're not your glasses. It affects everything in your life. Yeah. So I'm thrilled to have you in your learning body. And I, I'm so glad that you've been willing to share your um, experiences as we go along. Um, so what other things besides the traditional pain medicine or orthopedic route did you try? Were there other things that you tried? Oh, I tried physical therapy off and on for years. The last time uh, which was probably in September of 23. Uh, I went to a physical therapist that my husband had seen and really liked, but she was just, she was awful. She was by far the, the worst uh, physical therapist I'd ever had. Mm -hmm. uh, she was rigid. Uh, I'd come in and I'd talk about how much pain I was still in how much the exercises uh, were hurting me. And then finally, I mean, I stuck it out for four sessions. And then I said, I, I am done with physical therapy. And I just never, I just never pursued it. I really didn't think it was going to make a bit of difference for my pain. Yeah. So why don't you think it would, why didn't you think it would work by that point? Why, or why didn't it work? What do you know now maybe about that? I know that rigid programs of repetition do not work. Now I know it I know some people find a way to make it work work for them, but I've tried physical therapy off and on for years and I've really never uh, never seen any improvement and I've had some physical therapists that were very sensitive to what was going on with me uh, and really tried to work with me and modify things other other than like this woman that I saw last time. Uh, but it just, it, it never helped me, Cynthia. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry to hear that for sure. I would have liked you to have been able to find help sooner from those traditional routes that would have been okay for you. You know, they are okay for some people, right? They work for some people and they didn't work for you. So you say it took you 25 years to, to do something. And, and you, you think that the biggest reservation you had about not, not to do something, to do something with us. I, I have a joke I tell Darlene that's about my 15 year marketing plan but now you're going to make me change it to the 25 year marketing plan. <laughs> so I don't know if I've got to be around that many more years to benefit, but maybe some other Feldenkrais practitioner will be. Um, so was your biggest, was it a fear uh, or that kept you from joining us? Or do you think it was just this really set idea in your mind that an online program couldn't work? No, I think that was my earliest issue with it. Um, I, I don't, I can't remember where I saw the ease for knees, but I remember thinking, well, I'm going to start out with this because my, in addition to my back pain, I had reached the point with the Uflexa injections that they weren't working either. So not only was my back very painful, but now my knees, both knees were bad. It's like, oh my God, where do I go? What do I kind of, what do I have to lose? And then I, I, I wish I remembered where I saw that class. I was probably checking you out back then. Uh, and I saw that class and I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, when I talk about it, it's still, 
amazes me and and how this journey of like 20 plus years has brought me back to you why didn't i listen earlier but here i am yeah because you're in the field of if you're in the field of social work so you know we all make the best decisions that we know how to make at the time don't we we don't yes we do that's really easy to second guess ourselves but we we do base our decisions on what we know at the time but your sharing might help somebody else make the decision, you know, differently, because sometimes what we need to hear from is someone that feels more like us. Oh, you know, it's not, not, it's not the person, it's not Cynthia who teaches the work telling me it's Darlene who's sharing her own really heartfelt experience. And I know what that, that I would call it's like a feeling of a miracle. I would, that's how it has been for me. And I can still have that feeling over and over again in Feldenkrais where I go like, wow, that feels like a miracle. But I remember, you know, really feeling really clearly how when I was at my lowest point in my thirties, uh, that it, it just felt like it was, it was rescuing me from something that was otherwise I was really doomed, uh, to work with forever in a, in a, in a, in a really and have a really unpleasant life. You know, you try to make your best life possible, but it would, it was going to be a unpleasant life because as you said, it's like having on someone else's prescription eyeglasses. It's not, it doesn't allow you to see and experience the world in a more unbiased way. Everything is biased around pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So give me, give us, give us some examples of some really helpful takeaways or principles that you've gotten things that have really helped you uh, and, uh, and how you've applied them in your life? Well, I think the biggest thing I've learned from you is that stimulation of the muscles does not always translate into pain. Imagine that, because when that pain gate, I remember the old pain gate, therapy, because I used to read everything I could get my hands on that I thought was worthwhile. Uh, I'd read about pain and, and uh, no, it's, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing. Um, the value of moving slowly, the differences between Feldenkrais and physical therapy just that repetition and the whole somatic philosophy uh, of movement is just so different. You know, it's one thing to say they're slow movements, but it's, it's, it's very deep. It's deep in the body when you realize that. And that took me a little while because I wanted to see how far I could get. And, you know, uh, I keep going back to trying to do the exercises on the floor. Every once in a while, I think, oh, I'm going to try that. Even with that nice uh, massage table I bought, it's 30 inches wide. So it's a little narrow for some of the some of the lessons. Uh, but just being more open, seeing the connection. I'm really struggling with TMJ and teeth grinding. Uh, and to know that the pelvis is connected to the jaw, you know. Um, so just kind of broadening what I see and how I look at Feldenkrais and and what it can do uh being mindful of pain you know michael and i are meditators i've i'm certainly uh, a beginner but uh i've read a lot of buddhist philosophy that's been very helpful to me about mindfulness and how attachment creates suffering and i see an overlap there you know, about noticing. Um, so those are some of the biggest takeaways I've had. 
and I know I've taken a lot of notes about things uh, that have changed for me. And I'm going to go back through my notes and make a list in the next couple weeks that I'll send you of other things because I couldn't find them this morning. But I know they're in my notebook. That's fine. That's fine. What's been hard for you about the membership? Uh, you know, has there been anything hard about using the and using the online lessons or doing the live classes or anything that's really like, eh, well, it's been hard. not related to that, but I'm having trouble finding things. And uh, I've been wanting to do one of the uh, tech uh, sessions, but I haven't wanted to bother people a whole lot. I think it was Cherry that ultimately downloaded the Quirks and Jaw series for me. It's the only series that I have not been able to get into. When I go to click to view a lesson, it bounces me off the website. But she went on and downloaded all the audios for me. Uh, I had mentioned to her that I was struggling with TMJ and teeth grinding. She emailed me back and said, you know, how about if I download all the jaw stuff for you? I said, oh, that would be wonderful. Oh, that's great. I'm glad that they did that for you. And so me... I would just like to say something about that for a minute, which is um, we want to look for lessons for you around the thoracic spine and the, and the ribs, because that's a biggie for, yes, yes, your pelvis is connected. And but we have to be careful about when you have the the lumbar you have a lumbar fusion is that correct it's in your lumbar we have to be a little bit careful about the the amount of extension we ask for you when you have had a fusion but we do want to learn to get extension in that up that middle middle back and um so any of the series that we can uh find for you that are around the thoracic rib mobility should start to also help your tmj Great. I've tried everything. My my husband does clinical hypnosis. I've tried that. I've tried EMDR. I've tried um, EFT. Uh, yeah. I've tried sometimes, the sometimes, sometimes the you know. So you know, we we think of in the Feldenkrais method. We we think of we know that the entire body is one system. And that includes emotions, it includes your past, it includes your future, it includes all the, the things that you think about to get through your day, and it includes your movement, it includes what we call your physical mental organization, the way you organize yourself to take action in the world. So sometimes something, a lot of times TMJ is associated with really high stress type things. And uh, that people that hold a lot of tension in their jaw are people who are gripping and holding down and they often get assigned with an emotional um, meaning only. There's certain things that in the, body, in, the, in the human experience that traditionally get assigned more of a emotional based meaning, whatever emotional based means. It's a, again, it's a separation that idea is a separation right away of the unity of Darlene, the unity of Cynthia. Uh, but in my experience, I'm not going to say that the emotions don't contribute. So when you start talking about doing EFT and, uh, uh, EMDR. E yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, EMDR there, there, we're looking more at what I would call emotion based strategies mm -hmm. for solving it, which is okay. It might, it, it may work for somebody. It didn't work for you. Um, but we're really interested in how do you organize your movement so that the weight of your head becomes light. Therefore your jaw does not have to be compressed. It does not have to be compressed. So when you come into this sort of head forward posture that a lot of us, me included, tend to do more of as we age, but even young people can really have this right going on. Mm -hmm. And it's getting called right now, text neck, what 
which I think is not really a great idea, but I understand it because I'm doing this myself too quite a bit of the day. Mm -hmm. So it makes a difference. But when it comes forward like that, there's the head gets heavier and then there's just more work throughout the face. So as the head is able to come back and sit more fluidly on the spine, you have a better chance of releasing some of this additional tension. You'll be have an opportunity to become aware of maybe even how you create it through the day. Absolutely. I, I think you may have noticed that by now that sometimes you can notice when you're creating tension by by doing activating a particular muscle group or shifting your weight a certain way or bending in a certain way you're you're far enough along now that i'm sure you're finding those kinds of moments so that then you can go hmm what else could i do in this moment besides that thing um so we want to yeah it's become unconscious i'll be i can feel the tension and I don't even know that it's there right away, at least not now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So when that thoracic spine starts to come more into extension, oh, then the head becomes lighter. It uh-huh. can hold it. So uh, that that tendency to round in the upper back, we want to start to reverse some of that what's called, we want to start reversing any tendency towards a kind of hyperkyphosis, a hyper rounding, because it's supposed to round a little, it does round a little. It's not exactly like the gymnasts who you look at their backs and you go like, woo, <laughs> do they have, right, right, the gym, gymnasts on the Olympics right now, do they have any rounding in their upper back? They do, but not much, but <laughs> they do. But you can see how they are in that beautiful extension and that their heads can then be quite light, which is very important for them. <laughs> anyway um have you ever wanted to quit your learning body yet oh no no intention whatsoever have you wanted to quit doing lessons on a regular basis i think you're doing no. them pretty frequently no i am i uh i had been doing an hour to an hour and a half for the first six months or so um but i've gotten away from that in a way I don't like. I want to get back to uh, doing every day. Uh, This last two months or so with Michael and having those, the surgery for the kidney stones, and now he's got other nodes and nodules that have shown up that we're checking out. Uh, And how crazy that most of us do that. We get stressed And that means we should be doing more classes and more practice, but somehow, you know, I pulled away a little bit and I don't like that. I don't like it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure it's, it's difficult, isn't it? When things like that happen and I'm, it's a, it's an instinct in us. I think it's, I think it's a deep instinct Mm -hmm. to, to attend to the things that are urgent and your husband's health feels urgent and so then you're it sort of becomes consuming even though there would be pockets of time maybe that you could do it and sometimes there isn't any pockets of time so i often say darlene that the time to invest in yourself is when you feel good and do because a lot of people stop doing lessons when they feel better Mm. because they think that i feel better i can do fewer Mm -hmm. so the time to invest in yourself is actually when you feel better to keep that going Mm -hmm. because then there's going to be these things that happen in life where you it becomes all consuming for a while so like you and i were talking about our dog darby who was hit by a car uh, a little over a week ago and is now requires a lot of care as he heals from the surgery for his broken pelvis and i mean i'll have to be honest it is difficult for between Larry and I to manage to get time away from him because he has to be watched all the time. You have to be right with him. It's difficult to find time for some things that uh, it's not, I I'm used to doing it every morning. 
I'm used to doing awareness through movement, uh, uh, just like we have in your learning body every morning with the exception of Sundays. But now I go, oh, okay, this is, this is a hard time. And then I'm bending over because I'm holding his back legs up when he gets stands up. I'm bending over for very long periods of time. And then he has having trouble uh, defecating, pooping yesterday. And so I have to hold his hind haunches into a particular position, right? Because you have to have a position to make defecation easier. And so I squatted so much yesterday and I thought, my God, thank God I have a full squat in me, even though I have a full squat in me and I can do that with relative ease. When you start doing it for five minutes at a time, you notice, it. <laughs> you notice it. So I'm, I feel like that, oh, what I've been investing in myself in this other time where it's easier, I have more availability is helping me during this time where I have less availability for doing lessons. So something to think about. You'll get back to it. Oh, I have no doubt that I will. Um, I enjoyed the, uh, the free classes last week. Uh, I didn't do the last two because something happened with my back. I, I can't pin it on anything I did but my back got very sore and I thought, okay, we'll, we'll come back to that when, you know, when this discomfort, but I'm looking forward to next week. No, I have, uh, I've had a pattern in the past where I get excited about something and then I get bored or I, I get disinterested, but this is, this is totally different for me. This, I see this as a lifetime of commitment. And I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm so appreciative of the generosity in everything that's available. Uh, you know, I think that's something people really need to look at because, you know, everybody wants you to pay for something anymore. And I, I'm not opposed to people. Everybody needs to make a living. Uh, but it's it's such a value. I mean... It's just amazing to me. And, you know, you and Larry are so generous uh, that, uh, you know, when when I talk to people about uh, future life now, I always mention that, you know, the amount of wonderful information uh, that's available. I'm glad you experience it that way. You're absolutely right. People do have to get paid. They have to eat. They, uh, we, have, we have a staff that has to eat, that has to feed their children. So uh, at the same time, we definitely are passionate about what we do and helping people. And we want people to um, get the resources they need at the most reasonable price point that we can make it. And, um, and, and of course, some people maybe can't afford the program, but they sign up for free things with us on a regular basis. And some people apply for partial scholarships for some of the programs. So we do try hard on that. And I'm glad that you feel that way. And, you know, in your learning body, I, I feel like I build a relationship with anyone who wants to build a relationship with me. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of pre-recorded classes uh, that you're doing on your own. Right. But there's also the, uh, opportunity to attend live classes with me throughout the year. And if a person keeps their camera on and if they comment or write in the comments, uh, I, I feel, I know them after a few months and that's the same case with you. You've been interacting with me in classes and you've also been interacting with the team. And I know you've found the team to be really helpful for you, as you mentioned above. And, um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, you know, we're all in this together. We really and are. And that's an ongoing feeling, that personal touch, you know, uh, feeling like you belong. Yes. You yeah. know, you, you look at loneliness, you know, is epidemic today. And, you know, even though... I don't interact a lot with other members. I feel like I belong. 
I feel like I'm seen, I'm noticed. Uh, and I think the pods are great, by the way. Uh, we're still working. I'm still working. So I need a pod around 930 in the morning, anytime Monday through Friday. And I couldn't find that time yet, but I responded to the pod related email. And, you know, I'm hoping that maybe something else will open up. Maybe there's others out there that could yeah. use their time. Yeah, so that's something which we're giving a shot this year, a very specific kind of way of helping people inside of your learning body build a peer led, called, it's called a progress pod. And they can meet with uh, uh, up to eight other people as on a schedule that works for them. And you all can talk about what's going on in your lives. But the most important thing, in my opinion, <laughs> You know, this is my opinion is that you, you uh, keep each other motivated so that you would do one of the lessons from the library together. Mm -hmm. And um, we have seen, we have been facilitating these off and on throughout the years. And we have seen that where a group really gels, they stay together for a very long time. And so we know it's got a lot of value. I know it has a lot of value in my own life. So I have my own version for me of a progress pod. And that's the one that we meet actually um, six days a week. Wow. And that helps me to stay connected with the work in a way that's about helping myself and not about helping others, which can happen really easily when this is what you do as, as part of your mission and service, as well as it helps me feel really connected to people that care about me for me and not care about me as their uh, teacher or something, some other role. So uh, I'm really big on them. Most progress pods meet once a week and that's fine. It's totally fine. Um, some even meet every two weeks. That's fine. Whatever the group decides, they can, they can decide that. So yeah, I hope one that opens up for you at 930 is just takes a matter of somebody uh, wanting to be a little bit brave to say, I'll be the leader of a progress pod and be willing to just sort of guide the group just a tiny little bit to get us going. And then, um, and then it just takes care of itself pretty much. So, yeah. Well, what advice do you have for someone who is in the same kind of situation, maybe with their back or with their knees or with their jaw, um, that you were before you joined the program, what would you want to offer them? What do you mean by offer them? Say to them. Yeah, what advice would you have for them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I've recommended it to several clients. And um, people who know me well, because if somebody doesn't know me well, and I talk about this miracle, I mean, I feel... Uh, it just still feels unreal to me, even though I keep reminding myself of what it would it I mean to be 95% pain free most of the time. Um, but I will often say, well, there are free things you can try. And I always send them the one free recording where you talk about what the process is. You're the expert. I'd rather just refer them to you so I don't miss anything. And I'll send them some of your free uh, YouTube things and pre-recorded things. Um, and a lot of these people that I see have chronic pain, but there's something there's something missing in the. Uh, in the motivation or the openness to try something. Mm -hmm. uh, my a, husband, go ahead. I think there's a protectiveness. I mean, it, lo it looks like a motivation issue, but I actually think it's a protectiveness. And I, wanting I, think to be the, disappointed. I think for some people, it's not wanting to be disappointed. For some people, it's not wanting to be hurt. And the hurt can be physical or it can be emotional as in judged. Um, I think it's 
it's very challenging to hold open hope when you've tried a lot of things. Um, so, I mean, I used to say that in order for people to make their way to us, they had to be slightly des they had to be desperate and slightly open. That's what I would say. They have to be desperate and slightly open. We don't get too many people who come to us to improve performance, even though I have definitely got people who have come and improved performance. They're a small, mm -hmm. they're a small group. A big group comes because of a problem to solve. And I think that's who we generally just are as human beings. We're looking mm -hmm. for solutions to life every day, whether it's started way back when we were looking to find food or shelter or whatever, we're still looking for solutions to life. Oh. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't, so it is kind of an openness, but I think that openness, it may not be as driven by traditional, non-traditional as we think. I'm, I'm not sure about that. Like traditional, what doesn't fit the model of traditional care? I've done exercise. I've done this. I've done that. Why would that thing work? That can be true. I, I mean, it could be hard to conceptualize that this would really be different. And it could also, but it can also be true that when you say it's really different, that right away scares a person. It's a very scary thing to try something that is completely outside your experience of being an accepted approach. There's no like community support for it. You have to really be willing to go out on an edge. Mm -hmm. Even as I look back at what it was like for me when he told me that that was the only thing, you know, the spinal cord stimulator was the only thing he could offer me. Um, I, I I felt that desperateness and that scare, depression, seeing myself in a wheelchair. And then at some point I thought something has to change. If I'm not open to something, that's probably where I'm going to end up. And to gather enough energy to do that. And I didn't have any trouble. Once I realized that something else was out there, and the, when I started to think about how I had been fascinated by Feldenkrais all those years ago, when most people didn't even know what it was 20, 25 years ago, and here I am. Here I am, how things come around in life. Sometimes it takes us time to get there. Mm -hmm. yeah. My husband is struggling with back pain and he's had a couple radio frequency ablations. And uh, he said to me the other day, um, I better call Provenzano and schedule another radio frequency ablation. I said, no, you're not. No, you're not. I said, you've got to try. Feldenkrais and I don't know what it is if if it were I think it's a gender thing I I really do that men organize their experience in little compartments um, and women are much more fluid it's like a single uh, filament of yarn you know that what affects us now and you know and how we connect uh, so I don't know what he's going to do, but, uh, and I'm not sure where the resistance is, but I'm not the least bit happy about it. But anyway, that's. Yeah, well, you and you and you and I both know anyone who's been married more than uh, 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 12, 15 years, at least, I think, <laughs> has learned that uh, we have not that much influence over our spouses. And it, it will probably come from somebody else, even though he has witnessed the miracle in you. He, it will probably come from somebody else that he will make that choice. And we have to be okay with it. We have to be okay with it. And this is one of the things that, you know, uh, I know, you know, from your experience of working with people in coaching, again, people still make the best choices they know how to make. Sure. And that's a, that's a presupposition of Larry's work and my husband's work, my partner's work in NLP. 
And it's helped me a lot that people don't, people don't make stupid decisions. They make, nobody says, like Larry always says, nobody gets up today and says, Hey, how many stupid decisions could I make today? People are getting up going, okay, let's go. Uh, I can make it through this day more or less, and they will make the best decisions that they know how. And it's hard to accept that and respect that in our family members and others. And I have to say, Darlene, I think sometimes our biggest level of influence is not with the people in our immediate circle. It's with people that are two or three layers out because people in our immediate circle, I think they go to all kinds of places in their mind around, uh, oh, well, Darlene, she's always trying something new or, or uh, yeah, she says that about, you know, I mean, they, they do diff- interesting mm-hmm. things because they know us so well. And, and maybe also because intimacy, it's, intimacy is such tricky business. Yes. It's yes, such, it is. Such tricky business with our friends and with our loved ones. So uh, uh, I'm glad that you feel free to talk about it and you're able to share your experience because your experience is what's going to uh, impact people the most. I Um, hope so. I also wanted to mention Larry. I hope he's doing well. Uh, I've noticed he's uh, had some Facebook posts that I've seen and I like to comment on. Um, uh, I really appreciated the better days, better nights, because I've had sleeping issues in the past. Uh, that was very, very helpful. Um, yes. And I, and um, I actually had a client, uh, that comes to me privately who had never mentioned that she did that series with him a I think she did the first better day, better nights with him in 2020. And she said to me, as she was lying on the table this week, I loved that series with Larry on better days, better nights. And I am still using where he anchored in that feeling of clear relaxation. And then that, that secret handshake and the conch. So she like labeled for me the things that she's still using several years later. That's fantastic. And his uh, coach and crash, I made up little index cards for myself um, that I use. Uh, Very, very helpful. Very, very powerful. Fantastic. Those are all things that come out of his NLP success program. So it's great. It's great. Thank you so much for mentioning him, Darlene. And uh, his work. Uh, we always highlight his work towards the end of the year and the beginning of a year. So his, his, oh moment, his moment is coming here. And in terms of this being right now, August, uh, his moment is coming up here before too long where we'll highlight it even more, but I love his, his weekly mantras. And that's probably what you're post you're commenting yes. on a lot is in social media. He does a weekly mantra and um, they're lovely. They're really, they're really valuable. Darlene, thank you so much. I really you are very welcome having you in our community and our lives. 